All right, now's the time of our service where kids come up. So parents, if you feel safe, and kids, if you are willing to come up at this time, that would be great. So come on in and have a seat. Awesome. Good job, good job, good job. Good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Oh, it is good to be together. I've been waiting three weeks to preach this sermon, and so I did have time to fill up all of the other balls. So, Edward, again, thank you for your assistance last week. But we're talking today about how we need to build relationships with people inside and outside the church. But this is hard to do because sometimes we're different. Sometimes we think different things. Sometimes we say different things. And so sometimes it's hard to be in a community where there's lots of different beliefs and ideas. And so what we're going to see today is the Apostle Paul gives us sort of some bullet points to balance the tension between what Christ wants us to do and how we're called to treat others, whether it's inside the church or out. So I need two volunteers to help me out. Brent, you want to do it? All right, come on up. All right, so who can I? I think I'm going to have Vivian be the good guy. And Brent's going to be the bad guy. Is that okay, Brent? You're more mature. You can handle. I, I don't think you're a bad person, by the way. So um, please do not make any sort of extra reference to the color choices I made. Only later did I say, hmm, some people might get offended. So please don't read anything to the color choices. But I have some balls here. Can we see it? Very good. And so in today's passage, ladies, what we need to understand that the Lord calls us to love certain things and to hate certain things. So Vivian, you're going to help us out first with the red ball, which represents love. And so in one arm, I want you to hold that red ball. Very good. Vivian, you are called to love certain things. Some of the things that you're called to love is what God says is good. So good is represented by the green ball. So in the same arm, I want you to cling to those both. I think you could do this. Very good. All right. Very good. I think you can do this, right? Yeah. So Vivian knows that God calls her to love what is good, but we're also supposed to hate certain things. Hate is represented by orange. Ooh. And so in the other arm, I think you can do this, Vivian, you need to balance and tension loving good with hating something. Are you ready for this? You are called to hate what this is evil. And I'm sorry, Mom, I did not know this was going to be bear's color, so please forgive me, okay? It was not intentional. You are supposed to love what is good, but hate what is evil. All right, all right, so can you hold that for a little bit? It is so hard to keep those things in tension and to know that you're supposed to love what is good and hate what is evil. But here's the problem, and this is why this passage is so important for our church. Sometimes when we look at other people, so maybe look at Brenda and kind of give her the, the stink eye. <laughs> Sometimes when we look at other people, maybe in our family, and even in our church or our community, sometimes it looks like it's reversed. It's sometimes, are you ready for this? Sometimes we look at people and it seems like they love, uh-oh, what is evil? Everybody say, ooh. And then this is in a movie, would be like, dun, dun, dun. So Vivian's looking at Bryn, and it looks like, to her perspective, that Bryn loves what is evil, and oh no, hates what is good. Everybody go, oh. That is not good. That is not good. Edward, I'm so glad you pointed that out. And so how can we be in relationship with one another, especially if you're part of the same family or the same church, when you look and you look at Scripture and you say, I'm going to love what God says is good and I'm going to hate what God says is evil, but yet you look at your fellow Red Arrow member and it looks like that she hates what is evil. Or sorry, love what is evil. And again, it's, you got to juggle here. And hates what is good. And this, Vivian, is the hardest part of all. Are you ready? Sometimes, how many of you ever played dodgeball? Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> now again, for safety purposes, we're not going to have Bren actually throw the ball, but I'm going to pretend that Vivian, if you were standing there, and let's just say this is a whole big bag of evil, and Bren was throwing the ball. We're going to do slow motion. You ready? Oh, 
boink! Now everybody gasped. <gasps> now Vivian, if someone actually threw a ball of evil towards your head, what would you want to do? Duck! <laughs> oh, perfect. Someone who doesn't have the agility of Vivian, most people, when, when they get hit, what would you want to do? Jackson, help me out. If someone threw a ball at your head, what would you want to do? Throw it back. Now again, as much as we would all want to repay that evil with evil, mind blown, but what God says through the Apostle Paul is we are supposed to not return evil for evil, but actually return evil for good. And that's really, really hard because you get smacked in the face, you're like, oh, it's home. And you just want to throw it back. But no, Vivian, you want to share with her some good. So do you think you could carefully, intention, walk over there and give her some of that good? Can you give her? It's not easy, is it? It takes practice. Let's give Vivian and Brent a round of applause. So today we're talking about how we live in that tension and how even if someone we feel is hurling evil that they love at us, we're called to return with love and good. Great job, ladies. If you could carefully set those bombardment balls on there. There we go. Good job, everybody. Good job. You guys did a great job. So, if you remember, we have kind of taken a break from this series, and now we're going to return to this Rediscover Church Part 3. And can we see that first slide? And so, Pastor Maria, can you remind us where we've been the last few weeks? Yeah, so, beginning of January, we started a series called Rediscover Church, in which we decided that we were going to go through our vision statement, join the journey on the road with Jesus, building relationships along the way, as well as our operational values. Not because we need to revisit these values and visions because we need to change them, but because the world around us has changed. And so maybe the way we implement our vision and values needs to change and adjust. And so as a church, we need to have conversations about what does it mean to be the church to the new world that we live in today. And so um, we have gone through um, our vision statement as well as we're committed to praying for people who do not yet know Jesus. We're committed to developing relationships with people who don't know Jesus. And then we are committed to sharing the truth of Jesus Christ within those relationships. We reintroduced reaching out by reaching one and we asked that people would open up a peg in their life for somebody who doesn't already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I hope you've spent the past couple weeks praying um, more intentionally for your one, or if you don't have a one yet, praying for the Lord to reveal your one for you. Today, we move on to our next operational value, which is we are committed to deepening our relationships with God and with each other. Today, we're gonna to focus more on the deepening relationships with each other, um, because in a couple weeks after Drama Rama, the next operational value really lends itself well to deepening our relationship with God. So, as we dig into God's Word today, we're going to think about what it means to love each other sincerely. Excellent. And so before we look at this very powerful passage, you have to understand that the Apostle Paul is going to give some commands to the church. Now these commands are hard to understand, but even more difficult to actually live out. Because I tried to illustrate with the kids, you may look at someone, maybe even someone in this church is, wow, I look at their life and it seems like what I see is that they love evil things. And so how can you be in relationship with someone who seems so different? And that's really what our nation is facing right now. We live in a divided nation where neighbors and friends no longer speak to each other because the divide has grown and been polarized so much. And so when Paul commands the church to have harmony with each other, how are we supposed to do that? Well, if we can see that first slide, Ed. When the Apostle Paul talks about living in harmony with each other inside the church as well as with people outside of it, we see this is not so much think the same thing among one another. We don't want everybody to be robots. And think the same thing towards one another. So what does that mean? In other words, we should maintain the same attitude towards all, whatever their social, racial, or economic status. For when our minds have been renewed, that's earlier in the chapter, and we have learned to think soberly, and that's there as well, that transformed mindset will produce true harmony with one another. So keep that in mind as we look at these verses. It will be up on the screen. 
where the apostle calls the church, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And so bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Now, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. For on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. So do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so Paul didn't invent these commands. What he was doing was a logical step, an advancement, a furthering of listening to Christ's command to his followers, who said, love one another as I have loved you. That the kind of love we see in this text, the kind of love that Christ demonstrated, was a sacrificial love. A love that put the other person's needs before our own. And so as the early church did, we too, in 2021, need to apply these commands each and every day. Whether we're in worship together, whether we're at work, whether we're in community with other people, these wonderful commands help us to actually live out this command that Christ gave the whole church to love one another as he loved us. But again, we have this love that needs to be sincere. Most people that we interact with outside of this building, they don't really know what love is. They could say, I love tacos, or I love Tom Brady, which I hope he will retire today. <laughs> but when you use that word love, you have to understand, is that what Paul's talking about? No. This is a genuine, this is a sincere love that looks as another person created in the image of God, and says, what can I do to serve that person the way that God would want me to? And how do we do that? Well, we see this tension that I tried to illustrate with the kids, hating what is evil. Now, hate is a really strong word. And so sometimes Christians are kind of nervous about, I don't know if we should hate anything. Well, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, then you better believe we better hate the same things that God hates. And again, that's all throughout Scripture. But we hate what is evil and cling or love to what is good. And immediately, when three weeks ago, as I was studying this passage, I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be great if Vivian was standing here, barely able to hold these four different Pauls in tension with each other? But yet, that is the tension of God's people, loving what is good, hating what is evil. And as we do that, as we live in that, that wonderful tension, we're devoted to one another in love, honoring one another above ourselves. Now, when Bill Hoffman was on the elder board, he taught us a very important part of his family dynamic called FHB, Family Hold Back. And what this means is when the Hoffmans have guests over at their home, they used to tell their children, hey, I don't know if there's enough food. A couple of these guests are really big eaters. So I want what you to do is family hold back and don't eat your full until the guests' needs are met. And so when Bill was on the elder board, he pointed out that when we're in a Sunday morning, FHB everybody, granted we don't have coffee and cookies, but if you see someone in need, don't just make sure that you're focusing on your own needs. Family holds back so that those guests, for those people that are still wanting to feel enfolded in our church family, know that they are welcome and their needs are going to be met. So thank you, Bill and Jan. FHB. It's now part of the Red Arrow Glossary. Well done. But it's not just that. We need to never be lacking in zeal, keeping your spiritual fervor. This verse is where we get, I'm on fire for the Lord. When the Spirit of the Lord is in us, we can't help but have this urgency 
to treat people the way that we would want to be treated and to love them, not in fake ways, but in sincere ways. And we do that by keeping joyful in hope because we know that by serving others, we're serving the Lord. We're patient in affliction. Paul knows that life's going to be tough. We're faithful in prayer. Everything starts with prayer. And share with the Lord's people who are in need. Now, this is why we have here at Red Arrow the benevolent team. Sherry has done an amazing job over these years helping our church to meet those needs inside of the church. But you also need to know that each month our church gives resources to United Christian Services, which Sherry and John are also part of, in order to help those community members outside of our church family in need. And so we've been living out this command that the Apostle gives for 12 years. And we're going to continue to do it because sometimes we get in a bind. Sometimes our house burns down and we may need some help. Sometimes our car dies and we don't have the ability to pay for the repairs. All of those things we do as a church to help those members in need. Not only financially, but also with encouragement. And we do all of this by practicing hospitality. When Pastor Maria posted that her father had died, Someone from the church, and if you're watching, thank you for this post pointing out. I love the fact that how when I walked in the building, Pastor Wayne always shook my hand and said, good to see you. Now again, if you've ever experienced Pastor Wayne's handshake, even during COVID, you know, it. Oh, at first you're like, wow, he really wants me to feel welcome. But for a person that's longing to feel part of the family, what Pastor Wayne did for 40 some years of church ministry and all of the years of his life was to make sure that you felt welcome. And so you need to know, and it breaks my heart sometimes when I'm chatting with a person or I'm working over here and I see a new family walking in and they're kind of like a deer in the headlights. Where do we go? Do we sit down? Do we have to wear masks? Am I underdressed? And there's all this anxiety. And so sometimes I see some of our members checking with your friends, which you should do, but every once in a while, I want to take a dodgeball and throw it at your head and say, would you greet those people? Because again, this may be our one and only chance to show them that we would love for them to be part of this church community. So Pastor Wayne's not here anymore. Who's going to step up to fill that role each and every Sunday? Because when you're here, you're punched in. When you're in an event, you're punched in. Why? Because we want to make sure that we are practicing Hospitality. Even if you say, well, it's not my gifting, it doesn't matter. That's why Paul says it takes practice. It takes intentionality. And so this first section deals with more folks coming into this building, into our events. The second part is for those that are outside. Bless those who persecute you. Again, Vivian, that was hilarious when she said, I would duck. I mean, that's a smart thing to do, right? But again, ah, I think most of us, we, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You take that wound and knock them right back in the head. And yet, so it's hard to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Paul repeats it because he knows how hard it is. He did this, but why did he do it? Because he saw Christ do it first. Remember, Christ was being beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten. He could have called down an army of angels to wipe out his persecutors. And what did he do? On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. So Paul is only living out what Christ modeled. We should rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. When we are in a community, we weep when you need to weep. We find joy when we find joy with those. And we live in harmony with one another. This flies in the face of sometimes churches say we need to separate and be our separate little group because we're supposed to be the ones that are called out. Yes, that's true in a spiritual level, but we should be in the community. So when there's a reason to cry, the church gets a phone call and says, help us cry together. When there's something to celebrate in our community, the church gets the call, help us celebrate together. And so live in harmony. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Remember, Christ always got in trouble for hanging out with sinners, dirty tax collectors, harlots. And so Paul's saying, isn't that what we should do as well? That we should not look at a person, whether it's at a jail and say, you know what, I'm not going to invest in that person because they're, they're, they're dirty, they they're, they're did something wrong, and I'm not going to, no, no, no. Paul says the biggest, one of the biggest stumbling blocks for non-Christians looking in the church is they think we're hypocrites because they think we're perfect. 
and we walk around like snobs, like we're so much better than everybody else. Paul says, uh-uh, 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 no, do not be conceited. And then we have this last section. And so this is for both in and outside the church. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Now again, how many of you ever played dodgeball before? Now, outside of Chicago, we had a variation called bombardment. Bill Hawkins like, oh, I remember that. There was that lawsuit back in the early 80s. But here's the thing. The way that you play bombardment is when all the teams start, all of these balls are right in the middle, and you grab one, and if you get hit, you're out, and you have to go to the sideline. But if later in the game, if someone catches the ball, you get to come back in. And as I was reading this passage, I remember vividly, I was probably about Taylor's age, and I was playing with Barton, and this kid, I don't even remember his name, oh man, if there was an enemy at church, he was it for me. And he always tried to get me out of bombardment. And so he just, like, I did one of these, like, and it hit me right in the head. And as the welt was forming on my head, I'm standing on the sidelines. I'm, okay, so who can I get? Asher, you're going to be this kid. I just waited on the sidelines. I got so angry that when someone caught the ball, I got the ball. And then with everything within me, I hurled all of the hate and hate towards this kid as hard as I could. Nailed him right in the mouth and gave him a bloody lip. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I'm preaching this sermon because someone needs to grow in this. <laughs> now, Dave, as much as we all like, yeah, they got what they deserved. What Christ actually commands us when we're so angry, we're so upset, we see that person as the enemy, the little voice that we should say is not, yeah! The little voice we say, hey, do not repay evil for evil. And that ball should never leave our hands. Now that's hard. Thank you for being real, Dave, right? His love is genuine this morning, right? Again, instead of repaying evil with evil, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. I guarantee you my youth director took me aside afterwards and said, Ben, you know that you threw that ball really, really hard at that kid. Well, he deserved it. Oh, did he? Now I have to write an incident report, and now you're going to have to go and apologize to his parents for the stitches you gave the kid. How do you think I felt? I felt ashamed. Because that is not what Christ calls us to do. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That kind of sums it all up. But this is so hard. And yes, Ed, Ed's been itching to hit this slide the entire sermon. Is this true in all cases? Is there any exceptions to the rule and the command that God gives to the Apostle Paul? Of course there is. Our friend John Calvin gives two caveats. We should not seek peace so much that we refuse to undergo hatred for Christ. What that means is in many parts of the world, if you claim outwardly to be a Christian, you can lose your job. You can get put in jail. And so we should never hide the fact that Jesus is Lord even if we may experience hatred. And number two, courtesy should not descend to compliance leading us to flatter the vices of humanity for the sake of preserving the peace. When you see something that God says is evil, we can't be like, oh, I just don't want to offend anybody. If God hates it, we better speak out against it. And so I've always appreciated what R.C. Sproul used to say, how we ought to live at peace with everyone, with one another, unless someone is two things, commands us to do something God forbids, or forbidding us from doing something God commands. And so what does that look like? We recognize that we should not take revenge, my dear friends. Why? Because we know that we are not judge, jury, and executioner. We know that we serve a God of justice. And it's not our job to seek that justice. We shouldn't be Christian vigilantes. Instead, as we see in God's word, it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Now that's hard to do because we want justice now. But when we know that God is sovereign and he's going to take care of those injustices that we feel in his perfect time, we can step back and say, you know what? As much as I want to throw that pearl that evil at that guy that hurt me, I'm going to let the Lord take care of it in his time. 
In fact, if the enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. That's really hard to do if you view somebody as an enemy. But in doing this, you will heap burning coals on your head. And what that means is if you repay, if someone's hurling evil at you, and you return, give him good, everybody that watches that is going to make that person feel, wow, you know, maybe I'm the Goliath in the situation and not the David. And so again, nobody ever roots for the bad guy. And so finally, he makes this final statement, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so as you think back to the children's illustration, we can see it. Oh, uh, it should be the start of the, there it is. Very good. I need two more volunteers. Should I have the siblings go? All right, Taylor Jackson, come on up. All right, who wants to be the good guy? <laughs> All right. So, Taylor, you come over here. And in one arm, you are going to love what is good. And you are going to hate what is evil. Okay, can you hold that tension? You good? Now, even sometimes in families, you may look at a sibling, a parent, a cousin, a great uncle, and you may look at them, Taylor, and say, I don't know. I'm looking at him, and it seems that he loves what is evil. Oh, man. And don't say, yes, he does, okay? Again, this, we can do family counseling session later. Right now, it's just an illustration. But... Does that also mean, right, that he hates what is good? Okay, so turn so everybody at home can see you guys. Very good. Now, let's be honest. If you actually have someone in your family that you look at them and it seems like they love evil and hate what is good, you're going to have a hard time being in relationship with that person. And the same is true when that happens in the church. And what God calls us to do is even if someone in our family, whether that's our immediate family or our church family, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to do the slow motion. I know as much as you would like to pelt your sister, I'm not going to let you do it, man. Okay? So again, if Taylor was on the receiving end of Jackson playing dodgeball and that hit her right square in the nose. Now, Taylor, be honest. What would your immediate reaction be? To chuck it back at him. Thank you for being honest. And Dave would say, yeah! <laughs> but what we've learned in today's passage, as much as you would want to chuck it back at him, what we would want to do is look at what Christ has done. I'm going to borrow this. And what he says is good. And what he says we ought to love. That is what we should share with the people that we view as enemies. Oh, did you see how he gave the loving good of love? Because what happens is, even if we view this person as an enemy, over time, the love of God and the good things that God has given us is going to start to change their perspective. And eventually, they're going to realize that they too need to love what is good and hate what is evil. All right, let's give them a round of applause. You guys stay here with me. But now let's take this out into the community. We did inside the church, now let's do outside the church. Why is this so important? Well, in 2021, we are a divided nation, and please don't read into the color scheme. Ed, can we see the next slide? Oh, too fast. Oh, Ed's like, I'm going to skip that one right away. Don't even want to look at it. There we go. The 2020 election. The residue, the resentment, the adulation, the excitement, all of those mixed emotions this is our nation, folks. One of us looks at another one as an enemy. The other one looks at the other one as an enemy. This is probably the first time. Again, I'm also a historian. As I've done some of the research, this is really one of the first times in our nation's history where it is this polarized to the point. Can we see that recent poll, Ed? Can we see the next one? The biggest threat to American way of life is not economics, is not natural war, is not foreign threats, but other people in America. That when you look at your friends, your family, your neighbors, you look at them, what? As the enemy. A nation cannot survive with this amount of tension. So let's dig into it just briefly. Can we see the next one? Trump voters, view of Biden voters, 63% not favorable. This is the ministry that Red Row Ministries is trying to do. 
That if you're out in the community and you meet someone that is different political affiliation, how are you going to view them? Well, according to the polls, and I hope it's not anybody in this church, but 63% of people, yeah, I don't even want to talk to them. They're not even worth my time. But the reverse is true, right? Can we see it? Now, when it comes to the poll by the voters, view of Trump voters, 79% not favorable. How are we supposed to do ministry? If within even our church, people in this church look at each other who are, have different political views with such unfavorable ratings. Well, what can we do? We can look back to what God showed us today. Last slide, please, Ed. Now, if we truly can promote love and a sincere kind of love and the good things of God, that over time, even someone that we might disagree with politically starts to realize that they too, we hold up not what we think is good, but we hold up what God thinks is good. We don't love in fake ways, but we love in genuine ways. And so that over time, even if we don't agree with each other politically, we can still live in harmony with one another because we love each other with genuine Christ-like motivations. So Pastor Ray, what mechanisms, what sort of strategies do we have as a church to do that? So guys, you can put the, the balls back down. All right. Is it dying? No, that was me. Just shout. All right. Oh, there we go. I told you it was me. <laughs> Thank you. So in the past, we have introduced you to role in relationship. And I'll be honest, yesterday I sat down to update this document for 2021 so that it would be fresh and everything, and I thought, you know what? This is probably where we need the most changes in our church. So I didn't even update it. I encourage you to grab one and pray through it and think through, like, what are some suggestions? What are some ideas? What are some new ministries and different programs and all that kind of stuff that would develop new roles in our church, ways to serve, and new ways to build relationships, right? Because it is a different world that we live in now. And so as we think about the relationships that we want to have in this church, what are some ways that we can form them? I, I was watching last week when Ben said about the new wine skins, and he said, how long have we been waiting for the Price is Right women's event? And Sarah shouted out, too long, or I don't want to talk about it, <laughs> right? Some of our old wine skins aren't going to work anymore, and this is so full of wine skins. It's unbelievable. So we need to pray through this. Right? And we need to think through, like, okay, this is our chance, right? As a leadership team, we've been talking about, Ben mentioned canoeing the mountains last week. Um, we've been talking about what does it look like to go in uncharted territory now as a church. And we need your voices as part of this. So please, if you have ideas, give me a call. I'd love to talk about it. Um, but Paul does give us some ideas of how to love sincerely. Ed, can we look at those slides? Oh, I jumped to the top again. There we go. Love must be sincere. Now that word sincere, um, it comes from without hypocrisy. So in this first century Greek culture, they had plays, right? And the hypocrite was the person who wore a mask. And so when the original hearers of this text, of this letter, heard this, what they knew instantly was, oh, Paul doesn't want me to wear a mask. Paul doesn't want me to be fake in my love. He doesn't want me to act one way with a mask on and then really think another way. He doesn't want me to pretend to love somebody but then silently criticize and judge them behind their back, right? So this is being sincere. And then it goes on to say, hate what is evil, right? What is evil in the eyes of God? Abuse, bullying, right? Um, lying, murder, adultery, these are the evils that we are supposed to hate. Because when we hate these things as a church, then we are inspired to love what is good and take action, right? When we cling to what is good, we, we don't just get numb to these evils in the world. We actually want God to use us as part of the solution. And so it's so important that we don't become numb. It is so important that we do call evil evil and do notice these things, you know? If somebody is being bullied, we want to be the one to stand up to that injustice and to be an advocate for the victim. If somebody is lying, we want to speak truth, right? Those are the good things we cling to. And then Paul goes on to say, be devoted to one another in love. Now this is to be a community that's for each other, right? 
Now, what does it mean to be for each other? Well, we want God's best for each other. We don't want to be against each other. Being against each other would be that we felt competitive with one another, right? And we don't want to be apathetic towards each other because apathetic would mean that we don't care about each other or, and we don't love each other, right? No, we want to be for each other. The Holy Spirit is limitless, right? There's not this finite amount of resources. God is so big that his best can be for each person. It does not have to be at your expense. So that's why we can have an attitude of being a community that is for one another, not against. And then he goes on and basically gives us bullet points of what it means to be devoted to one another. Honor one another above ourselves. Ben brought up FHB. Absolutely, right? We don't want to be looking out for number one. We don't want to only think about our needs. We want to think about the other people around us, right? And then, never lacking in zeal and keep your spiritual fervor. Don't lose your passion for God because he never has lost his passion for you. Serving the Lord. Now, this is where we usually bring up roles and, and say, find a place to serve in this church. Well, the roles aren't the same, right? So we have to be creative. What does it look like to serve the Lord? This is why I brought out the, what on earth am I here for? Each and every one of you has a purpose given by the Lord. You have a calling in your life, right? That be in your workplace, in your family, in our church, you have purpose. And so if you're wrestling with what is an area for you to serve in, where are you serving? Um, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Any of the elders would, Ben, as well, because it's one of our greatest joy to help you discover your spiritual gifts and wrestle with God's calling for you. And then be joyful in hope. We have the hope that comes with the resurrected Lord. Right? He has conquered all things, including death. And so when we are in situations, we can keep our head up high. Did you hear that in the song? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Keep your head up high. Right? We have joy in the hope of Jesus Christ. And so even when things seem so down in the world around us, cling to the hope that we have. And then patient in affliction. We're going to go through hard times. We are going to have suffering here on this earth because it's broken. Right? So we need to be patient with each other. And this means having a default position of forgiveness for one another. If you're part of a covenant community, whether it's a marriage or a church, you're going to be hurt at times. And so we have to learn how to forgive. And then faithful in prayer. When we bring someone to the Lord in prayer, we're taking a helpless situation and bringing it to the one who provides help. Never feel like prayer is a little thing. Prayer is the ultimate thing that you can do for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayer is the ultimate act of love to get on your knees and pray for each other. And then share with the Lord's people who are in need. We have been so incredibly blessed We've been blessed to be a blessing. So that doesn't just mean financial ways, right? However you have been blessed by the Lord, he's given you those blessings so that you will use it for his kingdom. And all of this, doing all of these things, is practicing hospitality. Be devoted and practice hospitality are the bookends. They're the commands, and these are the ways to do that. So what does this mean for us today? Right? Well, I don't really have an action plan of here's our new roles and relationships, and so I'd love to have your input on that. But what I can say to you is it starts with us as individuals making a commitment to live this way towards each other. And we're going to mess up at times. And so it, it's a commitment to know that we are practicing this, and we're going to move forward as the Lord has um, set the path before us but we're committed to loving sincerely. Please pray with me now. Lord, thank you so much for our operational value that you gave us about deepening our relationship with, with you, but also with each other. We know that the church is your gift so that we don't have to walk this journey of life alone, that we have relationships to walk with us, people to love us and people for us to love. 
Lord, I just ask that in the coming months and years, that there would be a revival of love in this place, that we would be so overwhelmed by your love for us that it would just bubble forth from us and we would love each other and love the world around us. We don't want to be agents of division, Lord. We want to be agents of your peace, your reconciliation, and your love. So give us the eyes to see the opportunities to hate evil and to cling to what is good. Give us the eyes to see those opportunities where we can act contrary to what people would expect and repay evil with good. Lord, help us to understand and to know the love that we receive from you so that we can return that kind of sacrificial love to the people in our lives. In your name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.